Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to present my paper on the Boston mechanism with reservation priority. So just a brief overview of, of the project. So many school districts will reserve seats uh, to underrepresented groups in an attempt to increase their representation of these, of these underrepresented groups in public schools. This paper is the first paper uh, to study the implement, this implementation um, of reservations under what's called the Boston mechanism. And we'll discuss it and introduce it um, during the presentation. One of the main issues with the inclusion of the, of the reservations is that it's going to cause wastefulness and increase this level of manipulation, which can have adverse effects on our final assignment. I'm going to introduce an improvement to this mechanism that is going to um, help to fix some of the efficiency problems um, by eliminating the waste and um, increase the level of, of potential manipul manipulability. So school choice. Um, traditionally, neighborhood assignments um, place students in, into this, their schools based on their home address. So what do I mean by this? I mean that the school that you're going to attend is based on your where you're, you live. One of the issues with this is that the resulting student population at these schools is going to be very similar in race and socioeconomic status, as well as other factors. <clears throat> School choice was introduced as an attempt to help diversify student population across geographical and social barriers. And this is going to allow for a more round, well-rounded educational experience. And when I'm discussing school choice, what I'm working on is balancing the um, student preferences along with the priorities at schools, as well as what the capacity that schools have to assign to admit students. With this in mind, the goal is creating a fair and equitable assignment for, for students to attend a school. A popular method that's used um, to assign students um, is by immediately accepting a student who applies to the school until the school's capacity has been reached. Um, this method was made popular by the Boston Public School District, and thus the name of the mechanism is the Boston Mechanism. So I'll now take a brief moment to help illustrate how this mechanism works through a brief example. So let's suppose we have three students. We're also going to have two schools. Each of our students are going to have a preference over our schools and at each school, each student is going to have a priority um, at the school. For simplicity, let's assume that both schools have the same priority for all students. So the way the mechanism works is that each student is going to apply to their top ranked school. In this case, it's going to be student one and two are both going to apply to A and student three is going to apply to school B. Now, each school is going to choose and accept each student up to the capacity. So we're going to assume here that each school only has one available seat. So because we only have one available seat at A and, uh, and student one has the highest priority, they're going to be immediately accepted and student two will be rejected. At school, school B, we only have one student applying in one seat, so we'll assign that student, to, that student to that seat. Since I2 is rejected, they still would like to be assigned to school, so there will be a second round where they will apply to their second choice school, in this case it's B, but unfortunately there are no seats remaining there, so B will, will reject them and the mechanism will turn. This gives us our final assignment where we have one student we have student one assigned to A, student two unassigned, and student three assigned to B. Some schools, however, would like to create or ensure more diversity. So what do they do? They're going to implement some form of affirmative action policy. The school district will choose to implement this affirmative action policy through two channels. The first channel is going to be through the priority order, and the second one, which this paper is focused on, is um, by reserving specific seats for students. So the way the priority-based affirmative action works is this policy is going to enter our assignment through our, our priority order. And they, what they do is they're going to simply assign more priority points to a student who has a desirable trait. Um, an example can be uh, socioeconomic status, or, or it could be a race-based um, affirmative action policy. <clears throat> 
And this isn't unique to just the Barcelona example on the screen. In the US, they, you see this, this policy takes place in Seattle and in Pinellas County, which, um, which serves the Tampa St. Petersburg area. Like I said, this paper focuses more on the reserve-based affirmative action. And under this policy, schools are gonna give a higher priority to students um, until these reserved seats are full. One of the downsides to this method is because we're immediately accepting, we can be left out, we could have wasted seats. So schools attempt to, to eliminate this problem by um, creating wait lists. And if seats are still available in, in after, after the, the main mechanism is run, the schools will then assign students off of their wait list. Let's illustrate how this, this, this problem works through another quick example. Um, so, or rather, I'll show that it's wasteful through an example. And what do I mean by wasteful is that if the student is going to prefer her school um, or another school, um, and it, it, it's different than her assignment, but that school has an available seat, we call that a wasteful assignment. So let's suppose we have our three students again, um, but this time all three of our students are going to prefer school A to school B, and they have the same priority order um, as our previous example. Now, rather than having just one school seat available at each school, school A is going to have two seats available. However, one of these seats is going to be reserved, which is denoted by the green one, and the other seat is open to everyone. School two or school B is only going to have one, one seat available, similar to our previous problem. So again, in round one, all three of our students are going to apply, but even though school two has two of it or school one has two available seats, they're only going to accept student I. They're going to reject the other two because none of the other students meet this requirement for this reserved seat. In round two, both of those students will then apply to their second choice. In this case, it's school, um, school B. And school B will accept student two, filling their one seat and rejecting student three. So at the end of this first phase or this initial assignment problem, we're given this assignment. In the second round, or in phase one, only, um, only school A received applications in the first round. So the result being is they're the only school with a wait pool or a wait list. Since A also has this available seat, they're going to de-reserve the reserved seat and then make an offer to student two because student two had the higher priority. Um, student two is gonna prefer that seat at school A to the one she's currently assigned. So the result will be she'll give up her seat at school B um, and accept the one at school A. However, school B doesn't have a wait list or so they're not going to be able to make an offer to another school. <clears throat> so school two is going to be left with an empty seat and student three is go still going to be unassigned, which gives us this wasteful, this wasteful result, which is, is, is an issue. Another problem is that our, it, it can be manipulable. And what do I mean by manipulable is that if a student can take herself, can make herself better off, by misreporting her preference. So let's take a look again at the same example and our first and recall our first phase result. So our first phase result gave us this, where I1 is assigned to A, I student two assigned to B, and student three is unassigned. Well, let us suppose that student three instead reports her preferences as she prefers B over A. When we run the mechanism now, we're going to find that student A is going to be, uh, or student one is going to be assigned to A. Student two, uh, two will be rejected, but now student, student three is going to be assigned to B. In round two, student three, I'm um, sorry, student three has occupied the seat, so there are no seats available. I2 is rejected, which gives us this result with student one still assigned to A, but now student three has made herself better off by misreporting her preferences because she prefers a, she prefers B to being unassigned. So what do I do in this paper? In this paper, I propose a solution that's going to be an extension of the current mechanism. 
I'm going to eliminate this need for a second phase by tentatively assigning a student based on how she ranks the school. So if the seat remains, then we're going to tentatively give that seat to a student who prefers that school. And then once the mechanism terminates, we permanently assign all the students. So what do I mean by this? I'll illustrate it again through another example. In this example, we're going to have four students um, given uh, and we give their preferences as such. The difference being in this issue now or this problem is that we, the schools do not have a set priority order like they did before. So we need to create some way of breaking ties if we have two students with the same who applied to the same school and there are less seats. So we're going to introduce this tie breaking order, which I'll denote with so what I mean here is that uh, student one is higher than student two, who's higher than student three, and so on. So again, we're going to have our, our school, um, school A with two seats, one reserved and one not, and school B will only have one school. In the first round, we have our students apply like this, where students one, two, and three apply to A, and student four applies to B. Student, um, so school A is going to accept student and assign student one to that, that open seat, just like they did in the old one. But now they're going to tentatively assign student two to that, um, to that reserved seat because it's available. Student um, I4 is going to be accepted to be there, the only student who's applied there. And there's only one seat. So in round two, we can see that in round two, we have, it looks a little bit different because we still have all the students who applied applying again. They haven't permanently been accepted yet, like they did in the, in the traditional Boston. So we have here, I1 and I2 are our only students applying to A, they'll be held. But now we have two students applying to school B, I4 and I3. And the way our mechanism works is we're going to give a higher priority to student I-4 than I-3 because I-4 wants the school more. They've, they've listed the school B as the higher priority. So the result is even though student three has a higher tie-breaking score, they're given different priorities because I-4 essentially wants the school more by listing it higher. So the result is that I3 will be terminated and all of our assignments are made permanent, which gives us this final assignment here, where I students one and two assigned to A, student three is unassigned, and student four is assigned to school. Now I've highlighted two of the ways that we evaluate the, the, um, the mechanisms in my paper. Um, however, we do look at more, more than just this. We look at um, whether or not our mechanisms are respecting reserves and respecting priorities. Um, and we can see that both mechanisms achieve this goal. However, the current mechanism, as I noted, is wasteful. It's not wasteful in my proposed mechanism because we've eliminated this second, this second stage, which is where that wastefulness came from in our example. A downside is that both of our mechanisms are still manipulable. However, the mechanism that I have proposed is going to be more manipulable, meaning it's going to be harder for students to try and, and, and gain an advantage from misreporting uh, their, their preferences, which will hopefully result in a more equitable assignment um, and fair assignment among all of the students. So thank you for your time. Um, Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Yanin, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the affirmative action policies in Chinese high school admissions. 
so first, uh, let me briefly introduce the education system in China. So similarly, we have elementary schools and middle schools. Oh, sorry. And from elementary schools to middle schools, uh, that's like uh, that's based on your uh, base schools. So uh, usually students attend their base schools, and uh, from middle schools to to the high schools, there is a high school admission system. So uh, in China, about half of middle schools they successfully go to the high schools, and then after uh, and also. The other half, uh, they usually go to some vocational high schools uh, and also skilled worker schools. So basically, in those vocational schools, they learn some skills and uh, which uh, which they are ready for the labor markets after their graduation. And uh, then after their uh, education in some senior secondary schools, there is a, a college admissions. So students can choose to go to universities and colleges uh, and higher vocational colleges. Or some students, they decided to, to go to the labor market directly. And uh, so uh, uh, let me give you a brief background about the high school admissions. Uh, so the high school admission is totally exam-based. So uh, every year, there are about uh, 50 million students uh, uh, are expected to graduate from middle schools, but there are only 8 million high school seats. Uh, so the score, uh, the score a, students, a student gets uh, from the exam is used as a unique priorities for uh, all high schools over all students. So the high school admissions is uh, implemented independently in each city, and uh, there is a centralized uh, admission system. Uh, in this matching uh, system, there uh, uh, so high schools, including public and the private high, uh, private schools, they both uh, admit students through this centralized uh, uh, admission system. So our contribution is uh, proposing a new way to implement the matching. Uh, so our new methods improves the um, affirmative action. Uh, so before we introduce the new affirmative action policies, there are some traditional affirmative action uh, in, in policies in China. So uh, their old affirmative action is quite simple. That's basically add some bonus point, uh, add some bonus points during the exam. So students can get some extra score uh, in addition to the exam score. So they usually add some uh, scores to some minorities and uh, some children from a military family and also disabled people. Uh, and uh, then, so in recent year, uh, some uh, some researchers have found that the education inequalities in China uh, is increased uh, is very high, and uh, the rate of students from rural areas attending high school is increasing low. Uh, so they found that um, this is because. Uh, the rural areas they are usually underdeveloped, uh, underdeveloped and very poor. So here you can see there is a, a, a figure from the uh, based on the uh, disposable income in China. So you can see that the ratio of urban over rural ratio based on the disposable income is relatively high, and uh, also. Uh, some some research also find that students from poor areas are sig significantly less likely than those from non-poor areas to attend a middle uh, to attend a high school. And also, uh, the other reason is that the qualities of the quality of schools in rural areas uh, is relatively low. So. 
so the uh, so there are a few students from rural areas uh, can attend a uh, high school. So, so for the government, they are trying to reduce. Uh, they are trying to reduce education inequalities. So, there are some policies from the government that includes improve the school quality in rural areas. So, they they are trying to improve the teacher quality. So, they they encourage uh, undergraduate students to volunteer to teach at rural rural schools. Uh, and uh, by offering guaranteed graduate school admissions to those who are volunteers. And uh, they are trying to uh, uh, increase the classroom size. For example, they introduce multi-medium uh, classrooms. And also the, uh, the other policy is that they recommend uh, provinces and cities to allocate reserves in high school admissions. So uh, this is our focus today. And uh, uh, by 2021, so 30 out of uh, 31 prov uh, provinces have already adopted the, the reserve systems. So uh, I would like to introduce how the affirmative action policies work. Uh, so in China, each city uh, consists of several districts and I, every high school belongs to a, a district. Uh, so for high performing high schools, they are required to uh, reserve some seats for students attending middle school from its own district and sometimes uh, its neighboring districts. So for, for one district, uh, there may have both high performing and low performing middle schools. Uh, but the reserve system is intended to promote education equality and also provide more op opportunities for students from low performing middle schools. Uh, so, uh, for most um, low performing middle schools, they are from rural areas. So, the total number of seats and uh, the number of reserve seats at each high school uh, are determined by the local government. And uh, this number uh, may change every year. Uh, so, the reserve system in each city, they may be different, but generally uh, this, uh, there are some, uh, for each high school, there, there are some open seats and reserve seats. So the meaning of open seats is that uh, all students are eligible for open seats. So all students can get it. So for reserved seats, if, if a high school reserves some seats for a middle school, then those reserved seats can, can only be filled by students from that middle school. Uh, but if there are not enough qualified students to fill reserve seats, uh, those seats can be filled by students from other middle schools. The shortcoming is that in, in many cities, students can only choose one, one high school to, uh, to claim their uh, reserve seats. Uh, so, as you can see, if there are so many students, they only choose uh, they choose the same high school to claim their reserve seats. Then this high school can be over demanded, and uh, the uh, reserve seats from other high schools will be wasted. So for us, uh, we propose a new method to match students and uh, uh, schools without. Uh, restricting the number of schools for reserve seats that a student can choose. So our method is quite technical. So today I'm not going to talk about the details in our method. So the reason why for, mo for, the, uh, for most cities, they restrict the number of schools that a student can claim is that without this restriction, the admission would be very messy and they could uh, they and then the uh, the outcome may be uh, may not be fair, so they have to put such restriction. 
And uh, also, we all, our new method, it, uh, the utilization of reserve seats is improved. And uh, most importantly, for students uh, from low performing middle schools, they get more chances to be admitted by high, high schools. So that's, uh, that's our main contributions. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ronnie Dempsey, and I am presenting on the social dimensions of policing in the Asian American community. So I want to start out by talking, talking about conflict and violence. In recent years, the American people have mobilized protests the structure of the American policing in response to numerous events of police brutality and oppression against minorities. Uh, social justice movements like Black Lives Matters, Really, what it provides is a platform to empower people and create solidarity, allows people to speak out against police brutality and violence, and it allows them to express disapproval of an institute, institution built upon perceived structural racism. However, with that being said, some of the previous research has examined race and its intersection with law enforcement. There remains a gap in the, in the literature on studying Asian American population and in their interaction with law enforcement. This leads me into a critical inquiry. So the key question here is how does law enforcement in the United States intersect with the Asian American population? Uh, before I go any further, I need to talk about the myth of the model minority. So Asian Americans and the model minority myth, it's this view that individually or collectively as a model minority, it does not necessarily save them from racial uh, violence discrimination. And in this case, uh, we take a look at it from the perspective of law enforcement institution. It's really fraught with a lot of problems. Uh, it highlights high achieving successful individuals and then results in a lack of scientific research. So there's equity in research here uh, where this model minority exacerbates this perception of high achieving and successful individuals. However, with that being said, uh, it causes a, a segment of the population, in this case, Asian American population, to become in, invisible and then unworthy of uh, studies and, and research and attention. So this leads me into my qualitative methodology. So looking at the extant literature, uh, going into web of science as a scholarly database, uh, my preliminary results, 271 hits, 271 articles, after some initial screening, uh, looking for minority engagement in law enforcement, uh, really between the black and Latino population, uh, gave me 153 articles uh, and just over 56% of the literature. Drilling down and really digging into it deep, uh, Asian American population, just over 2% of the actual, uh, the actual uh, search string query hit. And that was really my impetus for the research. Most studies did not mention Asian Americans, and then quite a few of them, they were just grouped together uh, in the same category as Native Americans and others. And this is really a, a reflection of the US Census Bureau and how they just group uh, minorities into this one category. That's part of the problem as well. Also, this, there's this consideration that some researchers claim sufficient population size to actually merit any inclusion into any of the studies. So this interest for research led me into my semi-structured literature review, again, using Web of Science. And after uh, going through my query, and using my search words, uh, 11 results, and then after screening, seven. And then for the other piece of my methodology, the coding synthesis of concepts and overarching themes. Here, you can see the distribution of subcode occurrence in literature sample. You can see uh, color-coded. And what we, what we have from these subcodes really emerges into codes and categories. You can see a code of law enforcement, and then a code uh, where it merges into this category of justice. And then this other code where these subcodes merge into uh, sociological factors. 
And then lastly, there's some research gaps that uh, were highlighted in the, in the qualitative review. This brings us into our overarching themes. So four main overarching themes and then uh, research gaps. So law enforcement power and the model minority myth, justice, social media and solidarity with collective action, feminism and intersectionality. And I'll expand on those in the next slide. So discussion. So critique of law enforcement structure, power and model minority myth combined with the sociological and justice factors as in the previous slide. So combining those themes together presents an opportunity to separate ideology from the law enforcement structure without privileging any social conditions. So it, it, get, it provides a unique opportunity there. And from the, the coding and, and the qualitative research, what we see here is the Asian American community endures an intersectional dynamic with the social dimensions of American policing, and it does not receive equitable scholarly treatment. And what this leads us to is it, it creates the potential to promote exceptionalism when viewed from the black white binary perspective. Also I wanna highlight uh, on the bottom there of our slide with some of the pictures, this, this expand upon this idea from the concepts and themes of solidarity, intersectionality, and feminism. And it's really, it's, it's intersectionality, but with its feministic roots. Uh, and you can see here from the quote, this quote was from one of the, uh, one of the uh, articles in the literature sample where it talks about the South Asian community. And then really looking at addressing anti-blackness in our community. So it shows the solidarity, it's, it's uh, feministic leadership and intersectionality, and it really gets at the heart of, of what's going on here. So implications. So looking at from you know critical inquiry, critical theorist approach, we can split uh, social justice movement from the law enforcement institution. And really what we have is we're separating ideology from the institution. So protesting an alleged power structure informed by racist ideology and perceptions of corruption. And then with that, you know, police officers are assumed to be inherently racist, perpetuating this model minority myth black white dichotomy uh, and other forms of, the, uh, of oppression. And then by separating it, the ideology from the institution in a critical theorist approach, you can see the institution was established to serve and protect the people of the United States and then saw solidarity could facilitate police reform that inclusively manages the needs of the minority populace. So really what we're looking at is the implications is we're not necessarily looking at the institution, what it's designed for, we're looking at the ideology that drives the institution. So police reform would constitute a pragmatic solution based on critical exam examination of the ideological practices in law enforcement. So to further expand on that, so white consciousness, white privilege, white privilege supremacy does not make sense from the perspective of, of serving, protecting the public from an institutional perspective. However, in protecting white privilege or supremacy, law enforcement can become a tool. And again, it's not necessarily the institution, but the policing practices and at the micro level, and in certain instances could even be the meso level, individual actors as a result of the ideological influence that must change. So what it leads us to is address Asian American other minority exclusion, the public policy arena to promote holistic police form. And the quote from below from the literature review, public policies that reflect and reinforce racial relations also approach race in terms of black and white. So against this e equity thing. So it's in black and white and not necessarily uh, reflective of Native Americans, and in this case, Asian Americans. So I wanna take the opportunity to highlight some parallel research just to provide some other perspective from the other side of the spectrum. So these are excerpts from semi-structured interviews with law enforcement officers in North Carolina. So just to show you, to really uh, hit on the, the ideology versus the institution, that critical uh, theorist approach. And you can see in these excerpts, these quotes from the police officer during interviews, uh, trust, transparency, respect, being heard, citizen review board, uh, diversity is important, cops come in every demographic, microcosm of larger community, representative of the people. So these are from law enforcement officers showing their perspective from, from them being on the ground and working institution versus the ideology. So what this allows us 
to think about when we go into the concluding remarks is understanding social dimension completion and Asian American community and collectively in greater context of shared experience with other minority populations can help identify police reforms and interventions, uh, public policies that address ideological issues and pr promotes police reform, research, assess the conditions for scoping or systematic reviews, uh, also develop variables for empirical research and domain of Asian American uh, and that dynamic of law enforcement, also cross sectional studies with other populations. And then an environment that is representative and inclusive of all people, healthy discourse, building scholarly literature representative of minority communities. And then also, uh, la not, you know, lastly, is challenging this model minority myth. So acknowledgements, I would like to thank the Neural Computation Ethics Research Group at NC State University. Uh, and then also I'd like to do uh, thank Dr. Nathaniel Isaacson for his uh, mail seminar. Now, references. And this concludes my presentation. I'm sorry, gang, I've got two screens going right here. So I'm just trying to make sure I have the right screen actually playing. If you'll give me two seconds. Okay, so. All right, I think we're ready to begin. So anyways, um, greetings and good afternoon. My name is um, Katie Floyd Johnston. I am a PhD candidate in the teaching and learning and STEM education program here at NC State. And today I'm going to briefly discuss equity in the teaching and learning of mathematics. So the purpose of today is to um, primarily introduce um, a lot of research related to five equity driven pedagogical approaches. And then um, just from your presentations, um, I don't think any of you are math teachers, but if you were to be a math teacher, it would be just to critically reflect on your own current individual to, individual equity directed instructional practices that you use in your classroom. So to begin, we all have ideas about what equi equity might actually be. Um, but according to research, equity means fairness, not sameness. So when we look for evidence um, that we are achieving equity, we should not expect to find that everyone ends up in the same place. Um, and then equitable distribution of materials, um, human resources, the intellectually challenging curriculum, educational experiences that build on students' cultures, their language, their home experience, and their identities are all wrapped up into equity. And then the pedagogies that um, prepare students to engage in critical thought in democratic society. And there are several types of equity that you can find in educational literature. You can see several of those listed on the screen. And we know that there are barriers um, to student success, especially between the marginalized groups of students. Um, so I've listed quite a few and the literature that relates to these barriers, um, but I'm just going to briefly touch on a couple of them. So one of the issues is um, the student population in the American public schools we know has become increasingly diverse. However, the teacher workforce remains primarily white. We're currently sitting at around 80 percent. Um, Typical mathematics pedagogy, specifically in the mathematics classroom, is often teacher directed and it's often focused on students producing correct answers, um, memorizing rules and algorithms, a lot of repetitive practice, learning skills out of the context, and just relying on a textbook. Um, and historically, this type of pedagogy we know has been part of the white culture and is currently not meeting the needs of students from various cultures. And then lastly, um, Whiteness operates a lot of times in our teacher preparation programs and the ideas of dominant culture um, cultivate in teacher certification programs as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna to present to you dimensions of learning equity. So on the screen, you can see um, 
the dimensions of learning equity framework. And there's two axes. Along the dominant axes, you can see access and achievement. Um, most schools and mathematics departments typically agree upon this dimension. Access is the learning, access is the opportunity to learn. So questions that you can ask yourself is, do students have quality textbooks? Um, do students have access to the latest technology? Do students actually have access to a teacher with a mathematics degree? Um, and then there's also achievement. Achievement is um, a standardized achievement and participation. And questions you can ask yourself is, who takes the necessary math classes? Um, and who's actually being prepared to be part of the STEM pipeline? And then along the critical axis, we find identity and power. Identity is the um, balance between self and the global society and the way students are racialized, gendered, and classed. So questions you can often ask yourself are, do students have to park their identity at the door before they even enter the classroom? Um, are students allowed to use their home language and actually be themselves in the classroom? And then you have power. So power um, has two levels. There's a macro level and a micro level. Within the micro level of power is what happens actually inside the classroom. So who has power in the classroom? Whose ideas actually get revoiced? Um, who gets credit when working in a group? And then the macro level power is about what happens outside the classroom. So I, do students get the opportunity to use the math that they learn as a lens to critique what's going on in the world? Um, do they get to use math to actually do anything about these injustices? Um, so that is the dimensions of learning equity framework. And then another framework that I wanna introduce to you, if I can get my screens right, um, is the key elements of equity-driven mathematics teaching framework. And so you can see there's four key elements within this framework, standard-based math instruction, complex instruction, culturally relevant pedagogy, and critical mathematics education. And today I'm gonna to briefly give you literature on all four of these um, frameworks and these pedagogical models. So there are two dominant equity-directed pedagogical approaches according to this model. The first one is the standards-based um, instruction. And so standards-based instruction is a model that conceptualizes learning as engagement with mathematics and it results in conceptual understanding. It often promotes mathematical understanding as part of a social process as characterized by high expectations for students. A concern would be that teachers views about students often play a central role in their mathematical task selection. So even the tasks that they select for the students to partake in. And then we move right along to the next um, dominant equity directed pedagogical approach, which is complex instruction. And so complex instruction is a model that views the classroom as a social system consisting of authority and roles and responsibilities. A large concern within this um, pedagogical approach is there's often inequities in the larger society. Um, they're often replicated into the small group work. Um, and so what we encourage is teachers should create a multidimensional classroom, raising expectations for um, contributions from all students. And then critical equity directed pedagogical models. So there are two. Um, culturally relevant pedagogy is a model that seeks to address academic achievement while also working to affirm cultural identity. Um, cultural... Mm -mm. Um, cultural relevant pedagogy rests on three propositions. The first is students must experience academic success. The second is we would like for them to develop and maintain cultural competence. And then finally, students must develop critical consciousness. And then the last pedagogical approach that was in the um, framework that we mentioned earlier is the critical mathematics education. And so this model promotes a problem posing pedagogy. It's designed around ideas and questions that emerge in a student's relationship with the actual world. Um, a concern for this pedagogical approach is the teacher student relationship sometimes reinforces inequitable power dynamics. And so, um, I didn't mention earlier, but the framework that I mentioned to you um, in the past was from 2017. And in 2020, Barry extended that framework and takes a look um, at the four approaches that we just mentioned, 
with a, within a nested relationship. And so there's a nested relationship between the pedagogical practices. All of these pedagogies rely on teaching for understanding as a basic foundation. However, complex instruction extends standards-based instruction with an emphasis on group-worthy task and participation. Culturally relevant pedagogy further extends complex instruction by focusing on cultural context of teaching and learning. And then critical mathematics education introduces mathematics as a tool for identifying and analyzing critical features of society. And then finally, Barry introduces teaching math for social justice, which is the last um, block or era that you see on the screen. And this pedagogical approach analyzes mathematics to respond to social justices through the lens of power. And so just a couple of key points for the last um, pedagogical approach. So teaching math for social justice, this model creates opportunities to situate math in context that allows students to use their cultural, their social, and their contextual resources. It builds on an informed society. It often connects mathematics with students' cultural and community histories and empowers students to confront um, and solve real world challenges and helps students learn to use mathematics as a tool for social change. And so um, you can sit and um, think about these couple of um, pedagogical approaches that I've introduced um, about what the literature says, but nowhere does it tell you like step one, step two, step three, this is how you address equity within the mathematics classroom. And so Ladson Billings um, was confronted um, one time about this and the lady asked her she said everybody keeps telling us about multicultural pedagogy but nobody's actually telling us how to do it and Ladson Billings response was even if we could tell you how to do it I would not want us to tell you how to do it and so if we had the time and this wasn't a lightning presentation I would ask you to sit and um, you know give me your responses on what you think Ladson Billings is trying to portray in her response but I encourage you if you're interested um, my session is located in the folder 29 um, in the Google Drive. However, if you use this QR code, you can actually, it'll actually take you to an article. Um, and if you read paragraphs two and three on pages 67 and 68, it will give an explanation of what Ladson Billings was trying to portray through her response. And then finally, um, thank you. Um, for listening to me today. I apologize for a little bit of the tech issues with my multiple screens in my office at work. Um, if you want to check out some of the literature from today's session, you can use the QR code there and it will lead you to a Padlet which has a lot of different um, information. And then I just encourage you to keep in touch. So, and there's my contact information as well and all of the references.